Good morning, everyone. Uh, for, for today's scripture reading, we'll be reading from Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1 to 16. And it says, Therefore, I, the prisoner of the Lord, urge you to work worthy the calling you have received, with all humility and gentleness, with patience bearing with one another in love, making every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope, at your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in all. Now grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Sorry, For it says, when he ascended on high, he took the captives captive captive he gave gifts to people but what does he ascended mean except that he also descended to the lowest parts of the earth the one who descended is also the one who ascended far above all heavens to fill all things and he himself gave some to be apostles some prophets some evangelists some pastors and teachers to equip the saints for the work of the ministry to build up the body of Christ until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of God's Son, growing in maturity with a, stat a stature measured by Christ's fullness. Then we will no longer be little children tossed by the waves and blown around by every wind of teaching, by human cunning with cleverness in the techniques of deceit. But speaking the truth in love, let us grow in every way into him who is the head, Christ, from him the whole body fitting, fitted and knit together by every supporting ligament promotes the growth of the body for building itself up in love by the prophet walking in each individual part. That is the word of the Lord. This is the national football team of Argentina. They are currently the world champions. They were crowned world champions last year, November, after the World Cup tournament that took place in Qatar in the Middle East. Now, one can say a lot of things about a team that is crowned world champions. I want to say three things. The one is they were crowned world champions because they played as one. There was an incredible unity in that team. Each and every one of uh, uh, the players in that team also played well in their unique position. So even though they played in unity, they also played with great diversity. Everyone doing what they are supposed to do. This team has also been together for quite some time. And as they kept on playing together, they got better. And as they got better, they eventually won the World Cup and they were given the highest accolade. And that is world champs. Crucial to their mission of becoming world champions was one thing, one very important thing, and that is speaking the same language and speaking it fluently. Spanish is the national official language of Argentina. It would have been impossible for this team to win the World Cup, to play as a unified team, to play with great and rich diversity, and to be as good as they were if they were not able to talk to one another and talking to one another fluently. We live in South Africa, we've got 11 official languages. So as people who live in South Africa, we know what it's like to be fluent in a language and to not be fluent in a language. Do you know what I mean? So I'm currently speaking English and I am fluent in English, which means that I don't necessarily have to think about each and every word and the way that it comes out when I speak English. Every now and then I trip over a tense, but it's because it is my second language, but I am fluent in English. If I speak Afrikaans, this is so genaamd in the geval. I don't think what I say here, it comes from my life and I speak all my life long. That just means I never have to think about it. Kibulela sepedi ganyane. But I learned that while I was staying in Sunnyside in 2011, so I never got fluent in it. But at least I can say, like a proper job pastor, if I say goodbye to you. Me gusta Marbella en Abril was the only Spanish that I ever learned while I was living in England in 2004. That means I'm going to Marbella in April. <laughs> yeah, 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 someone taught me that. 
I can read Hebrew, but I can't speak it and I can't write it. I can read and write Greek, but I can't speak it. So I'm not fluent in it. I'm only fluent in English and in Afrikaans. Fluency is beautiful to behold. When you see people interacting with one another in languages in which they are fluent, it brings a dynamic to that interaction and to that relationship. Have you guys seen it? It's beautiful to behold in a transcultural church. Okay, so we speak English because everyone understands English. But the moment someone greets someone else in their first language and both of them are fluent in it, their whole demeanor and body posture just changes. It's beautiful to behold. Welcome to our new series. It's called Gospel Fluency. What is this series all about? It is about our ability as Christians to apply the gospel to every area of our lives. When you are fluent in the gospel, you tend to know how the gospel transforms your life. And you tend to know what it asks of you as a follower of Jesus without having to give it much thought. In exactly the same way that I speak a fluent language and it just comes naturally. If you are fluent in the gospel, you know what the Bible asks of you. You know what Jesus wants from you. You know how the Spirit leads. It comes naturally. You don't really have to think about it. If you are a follower of Jesus, there's no reason why you would not want this. Because you are part of the body. You're part of the church that speaks the gospel. So you have to be fluent in it. If you are listening to this sermon and you are not a follower of Jesus, then this series will give you a great understanding of the good news of Jesus and what it actually means to the Christian. It will also give you the opportunity to understand why we believe what we believe and also how it impacts our everyday lives. And that's important for me and for us as elders and for us as a preaching team as we start this series. Hear me, brothers and sisters, we, this is Fellowship City, are currently not a joyful, hopeful, revitalized, passionate, focused, expectant family of God's children. We are not. We're supposed to be, but we're not. We lack a freedom that comes with the gospel. We lack a lightness that comes with believing in the good news. We lack a joy because Jesus died for us. We just tasted it. And He's set us free from the bondage of sin. We lack a strength and a power that comes from the gospel and the Holy Spirit indwelling us. We're always tired and always pop and we always have problems. And I'm not saying this judging you. I'm saying this as your pastor. I love you. I lead you. I teach you. I pray for you. I listen to you. I give my time to you. So I know what's going on in your lives. This church is currently not a joyful family of God's children. And that's a problem. Because we believe the very thing that should enable our lives to look like that. Now look, I understand life's hard. I understand that fully. I understand you've got challenges. I understand that fully. I understand things don't always go according to plan. I understand that. My life is the same. But the gospel transcends our circumstances. And it enables us to be these kinds of people in the midst of our challenges. I can have joy while I'm in a really tough space. I can have peace when I have a lot of challenges. We can and we should. And that's where this series is supposed to take us. This church is a distracted, despondent, divided group of people at this moment. Sometimes we are dejected and sometimes we are just downright disobedient to Jesus. Not doing what He, suppo- what he asks of us. And it's because we will more than one thing. Our desires are not Jesus Christ and knowing Him fully and knowing everything that that means. We have more than one desire. We want money and we want houses and we want to invest in crypto and we want to go on holiday and we want to have great marriages and we want to be successful in sports and we want to chill and we want to Netflix and, 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 and. 
I'm not saying all of those things are wrong. I'm saying all of those things are second, and a distant second. Because a heart that is undivided is a heart that desires only one thing. And that is God and intimacy with Him. Seeing His kingdom. Experiencing the life that He gives us that is a life in abundance. We are distracted. Think of the way that you spend your time, your money, and every waking moment. What what proportion of that does God get? And does His kingdom get? We are distracted people, and it's not going to get better unless we choose to say, this heart of mine wants one thing. The creator and the sustainer of the universe, the God who saved me, the God who created me, knowing Him fully, living according to His purposes, discovering Him through the pages of Scripture, pouring out my heart to Him and learning how to pray to Him. If you do not make the conscious decision that that is the only thing you want, you will remain distracted. And you will remain depressed and dejected and despondent and tired and pop. Because He is life. And it's His breath in our lungs that we sang about earlier. This church needs to become fluent in the gospel. And the only thing that can revive and revitalize us is the very good news of Jesus Christ. It should become real to you. It should come you when you see a body broken and blood flowing for you. It should pierce your heart. It should convict you. It should liberate you. It should give you life. Do you know this gospel? And can you speak it fluently? Do you know how it transforms your life And how it applies to your everyday life. We believe that our church should become fluent in the gospel. Fam, we are trusting that God will do something special in the life of our church through this series. Starting today, I'm fasting for eight weeks. And when I abstain from the things that I'm fasting of, I will pray. And not only will I pray, I will cry out to God to do a mighty work in us. Because if He does, we will be an unstoppable force of light in this place if we are ignited by the gospel once again. We sang about the gospel. We saw the gospel. We tasted the gospel. Now let the gospel set you ablaze and change you inside out. We are going to finish the series after eight weeks with baptism. And we trust in God that people will be baptized in this place. That people will say, I pledge my allegiance to Jesus. And that they will not turn back. Let me make my case. Why should we be able to speak the gospel fluently? Three points. We should be able to speak the gospel fluently for the sake of our spiritual unity. For the sake of our spiritual diversity. And for the sake of our growing maturity. That's exactly what I said about the Argentina football team. They played as one. Everyone played really well in their own position. And they got better and better and better. That's why we need to speak the gospel fluently. So that the church can have spiritual unity, spiritual diversity, and spiritual maturity. And I'll explain to you what I mean with that. Let's pray. Lord Jesus... We are ready to hear from you. We are ready to be edified, encouraged, convicted, and liberated by your good news. We are open to the work that you want to do in us. Please do so, Father God. Change us today. Ignite us today. Set our hearts ablaze today. We want you in this place. We want your spirit. We want your life. And our desire, Lord Jesus, will not change. Therefore, meet us in this place, we pray. In your name. Amen. We're going to look at each of those key points. Uh, It's emphasized and underlined, as I always do. And as we work through them, I need you to ask yourself a couple of questions. Do I know what this thing means? Okay, so if you see a bold and underline, Rudolf, if I can just have the first slide, please. 
If you see the word prisoner, if you see the word calling, if you see humility, if you see gentleness, patience, love, and all of those words, I want you to ask yourself, do I actually know what this means? Do I talk about this? Do I know how it applies to my life? And do I know how it applies to the life of someone else? Because you are fluent in the gospel if you answer yes to all of these questions. So keep those four questions with you. Don't tuck them away. Have them on your notes. And then we'll work through it. Why should we be able to speak the gospel fluently? For the sake of our spiritual unity. Look at the first one in verse 1. Work, oh, sorry, not work, walk. Walk worthy of the calling you have received. You and I are united by our divine calling. And we should walk in a way that represents that calling. Every single Christian should walk. Walk is an important word. We'll see it uh, as you keep on reading Ephesians. Walk like you are called. Walk like you have a jersey. Think of the Argentina football team. Someone gave each player a jersey and said, I chose you to be part of this team. Now go and play. And play your heart out. Play as if you are representing your national football team. Because you've got the badge. We have the badge. We've been called to something. We are called ambassadors of Christ in the Bible. All of us wear the same jersey, we wear the same badge, and we play for the same team. Now play as if you were called for this team. Do you do it? Do you understand that you've been called? Does your life represent the gospel well because you're wearing the badge? And you're supposed to live like one of Jesus' followers. Fam, there's no distinction between my Christian life and my normal life. There's just life. So does your life speak of Christ or does it not? What does a life as ambassador of Christ look like? There's your key word. You're a prisoner. I don't know about you, but there's not a lot of freedom of movement in a prison. You do what you're told to do. There's clear boundaries. You surrender to the system. You don't live life in prison on your own terms. So you don't live life as a Christian on your own terms. You live it on God's terms. And you play according to His plan. Because He's called you and He's given you the jersey. We're united by this calling. And we need to be able to speak about these things. We need to be able to know what this means for us and for others. I need to be able to sit with this and think of my own life and my own calling. I need to be accountable for it. Then we'll be speaking it fluently. Then we'll be united. Look at verses 2 and 3. We are also united by Christ-like conduct. We behave like Jesus behaved. Look at verse 2 and 3. Humility, gentleness, patience, bearing with one another in love, making effort to keep unity and the bond of peace. Jesus Christ embodies these virtues perfectly. He is the perfect example of these things. Now look, check this. The more we look to Him, the more we look alike, and the more we are unified, and the more we are and will become one. Do you guys see that? I mean, all of us are unique. But as we grow in Christ, we embody these very virtues that He embodied perfectly. And if I grow in humility and Kone grows in humility, then we start looking alike. And the more Kone and I look alike, the more we are unified. And the more we are unified, the more people will see who we represent. Because we play the same game. So if I ask you, does your life represent the gospel well, then I want to ask you, is your life filled with humility, gentleness, patience, love, and all those other emphasized words? And if not, do you know that that is what your life is supposed to look like? 
That's why we worship Jesus. That's why we read about Jesus. That's why we surrender our lives to Jesus. That's why we chat to Jesus. Because we want to be like Jesus. And if we want to live like this, we have to live against the grain of culture. Because these virtues are not esteemed by culture. I can promise you that. Common culture and everything out there won't help you to grow in humility. We need to help each other grow in humility. That's why we need to talk about humility. That's why you need to know that you ought to be humble. Quick definition. Tim Keller says this on humility. Humility is not thinking less of yourself. Humility is thinking of yourself less. Can I say that again? Humility doesn't mean I'm worthless and worth nothing. Humility means you think about yourself less. Gentleness. Gentleness doesn't mean that I'm a pushover and I never assert myself, but gentleness means that I can control my strength and that I never overpower anyone. I'm always approachable and always open. Can we talk about patience? I'll be quick. I knew that you were going to laugh because we struggle with patience. I can ask you now, how are you doing in patience? And you can say, dude, I am solid. Can we chat about it when you stand in a queue? Can we talk about patience when you are in traffic? Can we talk about patience when you have to wait for what you want? Then it's a different ball game. Bearing with one another. It means putting up with one another. Even those that annoy you. Newsflash, you also annoy someone. It's always a hard one to accept. <laughs> you know, I'm struggling with all these annoying people. Until someone says to you, dude, you are very annoying. And then you just have to face that. All of us annoy someone. But what uh, uh, the virtues of the church are, or what Jesus embodied, is that he puts up with those who annoy him. And then, look at keeping the unity making every effort to keep the unity. Do you guys see that we keep the unity? We don't create the unity. Do you guys see it? Keep the unity that the Spirit created. Jesus died so that we can be one. So nurture it. Keep it. Protect it. Make an effort to do it. Because it's not ours, it's His. But He gave it to us. So we should actively be keeping it. We are unified around this conduct. Intentionally choosing these things also asks for renouncing the opposite from it. Repenting from it. Intentionally turning away from it. Saying that I renounce impatience. I renounce aggression. I renounce pride. I renounce the cancel culture. I'm repenting from it. I'm turning away from it. And I'm going to conduct myself in this way. Because that's what the gospel asks of me. As I become fluent in it, I know what it asks of me. We are also unified by our confession. Look at verses 4 to 6. So this is all still in the space of unity. Fam, we believe something. We do. And that is what we share in common. We are unified around the truth. We are unified around a body of beliefs about Jesus himself. Our host says that every Sunday, a gospel-centered church means a life centered saturated around the birth, life, death, resurrection, ascension, return of Jesus Christ. We believe in these things. And this is what holds us together. Look at that. One, 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 one. One, one, one. We are one. Because we have the same seven things. And these seven topics are the seven essentials for the Christian church. These are the things we'll die for. I'll die for the body, the spirit, the hope, the Lord, the faith, the baptism, the God and the Father. That's like core to what we believe. And we are unified in these things. Do you actually know what these things mean? Do you ever talk about faith and hope and God 
and baptism and the spirit and the body. Because if you don't, you're not fluent in it. And you've got no idea how this applies to your life. Remember the four questions that I asked earlier. Do you guys see the Trinity? Spirit, Lord, God. One God. Three persons. Diverse, but unified. Yeah? That's who we are. Diverse, but unified. That's the good news of Jesus Christ. God had a grand plan for humanity. And God executed that grand plan for humanity. And that grand plan for humanity is that God wanted to be in relationship with the very human beings that He created in His image. And He made a way for the distance to be cleared between Him and humanity through Jesus Christ. We said it this morning, and I'm saying it again now. That's the good news. The good news is that all of these things are applicable to us, relevant to us, and available to us because God decided to die in our place. Look at what is given to you. A new everything. Why would you not take it? I've got no idea. Because the moment you do believe in it, it does change everything. How are you doing so far? Are you fluent in these things? Do you know what it means? Do you talk about it? Do you know what it means to you? Do you know what it means to others? Let's look at the second one. Why should we be able to speak the gospel fluently? Well, for the sake of our spiritual diversity. So, verses 7 to 12, the scripture that you have on screen now, describes how the church should function. And it's really straightforward. It says we have diverse gifts. And then it says we have diverse responsibilities. Think football team. Someone can do a really good sliding tackle. Someone can shoot the ball really hard. Someone can keep the ball out of the goal. That's your gift. So according to your gift, you were given a responsibility. So one plays defender, one plays striker, one plays goalie. Diverse, but we all play for the same team. Now, Grace was given to each one of us according to how awesome we are, how obedient we are, and how morally upstanding we are. Is that what it says? It says, according to the measure of Christ, He gave grace to each one of us. All of us have received the gift. And all of us have received the gift by grace. This quote in verse 8 comes from Psalm 68, verse 18. It is a victory psalm. And what it describes in verse 68, verse 18 is if victory, um, how do you say it? If victory was gotten, if victory was won, if you won on the battlefield, and you came back, you gave away the very things that you took on the battlefield. Right? So, I won, something became mine, and now I'm dishing it out freely to my people to celebrate the win. That's exactly what Paul is pointing to here. He's saying in exactly the same way that victory was won and gifts were given, that's what Jesus did. Because he won victory over death, and now he's dishing out lavish gifts according to his measure. He decides how he wants to do it. So he won, and he generously gave. Do you know what your gift is? Do you know what your unique contribution is? Because you should. I can ask you a simple question like, what do you love to do? Maybe that's a good question to ask you. Let me ask you that question now. What do you love to do? Because in that, God has placed something that He can use in His church and for His purposes. 
if I would go around with a mic and ask each and every one of you, we'll get a massively diverse group of answers. Because unity doesn't mean sameness. There's unity in our diversity. All the lists in the New Testament that explain the gifts that God has given to His people have a beautiful diversity to it. You have a gift. What is it? Are you fluent in it? Do you know what it means? Do you know how to use it? Do you ever talk to someone about gifts? Because if you don't, then you're not fluent in it. So we've got diverse gifts, and we also have diverse responsibilities. Look at verse 11, and look at verse 12. Someone is equipping, and someone is doing. Do you guys see that? And the people who are equipping are called apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. And the people who are doing is the saints, the church. And they don't do it because the pastors tell them to do it. They do it to build up the body of Christ. So the leaders equip the saints. The saints do the work of ministry. And we are all in this together. Different in our gifts and responsibilities, but all playing together. Now, if a teacher of the word, like myself, stands on a stage and says, as a Christian, you ought to, or you need to, and I use words like, you have to work, then often people go, oh, legalism, legalism. Grace only, grace freely. Absolutely, I started my sermon there. But do you guys see that the word work is in verse 12? And do you guys see that the work is not for your sake? It's to build us up. It's to help us grow. It's to help us become complete. That's what Jesus wants of His church. I love my kids where they are at the moment. They were beautiful when they were two months old as well. But man, I love seeing them growing up. And I really want them to grow up. And I want them to grow up like solid adults who knows who they are, who God is, and what God has called for, uh, to do for them. Uh, what has God called them for to do? See, that's me not being that fluent. You guys see them? We have to work. God works. He worked. He still works. And we imitate Him. Ephesians 2, verse 10. Look at it. For we are His workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus for what? For binging Netflix. For having the car of your dreams. For having a large property portfolio. For having a big bank account and a nice pension. For good works. Which God prepared ahead of time for us to do. That should be your focus. That's what your work is. Not saying that your day job is unimportant. But it is second. Far second. This is of first importance for Christians. Question, what are you doing with what you have been given? Because if you are doing the right thing with what you've been given, look at the result, building up in verse 12. If you actually do what God wants you to do, the result will be that the church wins and you do too. Look at this quote from Paul Tripp. We simply weren't constructed to live only for ourselves. We were placed on earth to be part of something bigger than the narrow borders of our own survival and our own little definition of happiness. That is the truth. Can you speak it? Are you fluent in this? Do you know what this means to you? Last one. Why should we be able to speak the gospel fluently? For the sake of our growing maturity. Speaking the gospel fluently is part of growing up, fam. Part of growing up as a human being is becoming fluent in a language. Right? Ba, 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 ba. Da, 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 da. Dad, can I please have a muffin? Do you guys see the progression there? It's called growing up. It starts like a baby, but you have to be able to speak the language as you get older. And it's the same for us. As we grow up, we become fluent in the gospel. Who's the perfect example of growing up? Jesus Christ Himself. 
Now, if you, lo- if you look at verses uh, 14 to 17, well, actually 13 to 17, I just want to highlight four really quick ones. These are signs that you are growing up. Okay? These are things that are important for our own spiritual maturity. The first one is we need some doctrinal stability. Kids believe stuff that simply is not true. Any kids in the house? I see one. I want to use the tooth fairy as an example. I might cause a lot of pain for you, buddy. I'm really sorry. Guys, Father Christmas, the tooth fairy, wearing your undies and then having the power of Superman. That's the kind of stuff that kids believe. They believe anything. But as you grow up, you learn the ability to know what is not true. Christians who are still babies also believe everything. And we should not be like that. We should know what we believe. And we need to sink our roots deeply into it. Do you know what pains me? Is if false teaching and superstitions and cultural practices gets elevated to the level of solid biblical teaching. And what pains me is if people believe it. I can understand a young Christian hearing something from someone and then going, oh, is that how Jesus works? I say this formula and then he gives that to me. I can understand that. But mature Christians forwarding me stuff and calling me about stuff and reading about stuff that simply isn't true, it gives me great pain. Because you're not a kid anymore. You should know what is right and you should know what is false. So, verse 13 says, and verse 14, we should no longer be little children, tossed around, blown around by cunning and by deceit. We should have stability in what we believe. Guys, that's why we teach so hard in this church. I promise you, Lesejo and I, and Shiami who's on the preaching team, and whoever else preaches at this church, we take this very seriously. Because what I say from this stage behind this music stand is supposed to build you up and grow you up and give you the opportunity to sink your roots deeply. Look at verse 13. We should grow up in our faith and knowledge of God's Son into maturity measured by who? With a stature measured by Christ's fullness. How are you doing? Anyone scored 100% this week? We can't. But that's what we should point to. Our bar is very, very low at the moment when it comes to what it means to be a Christian. You can't muck about around that bar because the bar is Christ. And that's the one we measure ourselves against. Quick question. If I ask the person, listen, closest to you, if you have grown up in the area of Christ-likeness, what will they say? Because they can't lie, your whole life is open to them. One of the ways in which we grow up is we learn to speak the truth, look at verse 15, in love. So that we can grow in every way into Him that is Jesus. We are people of the truth and we are people of love both at the same time. Truth people are not unloving, judgmental people. We often think that way. If someone is set in their ways or what they believe, they're very judgmental and unloving. That is not the truth. Loving people are not accepting anything and everything kind of people. Jesus is the supreme example. Listen, fam, if you miss everything today, get this. Jesus was firm in his conviction and awesome in his compassion both at the same time. That's truth and love. Not a single person that enacted with Jesus wondered what his stance was on certain things. He was very clear about it. His teaching was public. His teaching went viral. But still, people flocked to him. Why? Because he was loving. He was compassionate towards people. Everyone knew what Jesus taught about marriage and sexuality. And still a prostitute comes and she kneels at his feet. 
She knew what Jesus believed about sex and sexuality. But she still came to him. Because he was loving, compassionate. He didn't say, yeah, you know what, I understand you fell on hard times. He didn't. But he was full of love. And she was drawn to him. And she changed because he forgave her her sins. Truth people. Love people. And then onto our fluency theme, speaking these things. Not just holding them dear in our hearts when I have a five minute devotion in the morning while scrolling through my Instagram news feed. We should be able to talk about these things. Lastly, contribution. Part of growing up is getting involved. Period. You have to contribute to the work of the church. Because every part, working together properly, will have us function, and it will have us built up. Do you guys see that? That's why we want your contribution. That's why you need to contribute. And I'm not only talking about money now. I'm talking about you and your gifts and your hands and your talents that that has been given to you. Because look at it. It promotes the growth of the body. It sounds like a supplement. For building itself up in love, what a great result, by the proper working of each individual part. Real talk. This church is lacking Not because Jesus hasn't given this church what they need. This church is lacking because the gifts that Jesus has given to this church is not being used. Period. That's a problem. Because we won't function properly. We won't be built up to be who God has called us to be. But if we do, we will grow into great, great maturity. Remember the four questions. How are you doing? Do you know what these things mean? Do you talk about it? Do you know how it applies to your life? Do you know how it applies to the life of others? Because if all of us, at some point in the future, can answer yes, then we've become fluent in the gospel. And we'll see a different dynamic between our people. Do you remember I used that example earlier of if two people meet each other both in their first language, just how everything changes and it's so beautiful to behold. That's what I want this church to be. That's what Jesus wants this church to be. That's what the Bible wants this church to be. That's what Lesecho, as my fellow elder, wants this church to be. We want to see how we become fluent in the good news of Jesus Christ and we want to behold the beauty of how that changes, the interactions between people, how their lives transform, how they change and how that changes our witness. Why should we be able to speak the gospel fluently? For the sake of our spiritual unity, for the sake of our spiritual diversity and for the sake of our growing maturity. I want to land by challenging you to fast from something. Not in a legalistic kind of way. Ooh, the pastor said I must fast, so now I'm fasting. Please do not fast if that's your posture. Fast if you want to press into this. Abstain from something so that you can engage in prayer and that you can experience your deep need for God. Like your deep need for coffee. So when you fast coffee, you're going to feel the need. And that's going to draw you closer to God. It's just an example. Let's press into this. San Marie, you can uh, take your place behind the piano, please. For the duration of this series, let's intentionally choose to become fluent in these things. Do you guys know how the Argentinians became World Cup winners? Practice, practice, practice practice every single day the greatest of all time Lionel Messi has to train every single day look he can kick a ball fam let's be honest but he has to stay in practice to be able to kick the ball in that way let's press into this 
but not for our own achievement. Oh, our desires can be so selfish. And our goals can be so selfish. Think of yourself less. And sign up for something that will not only fulfill you, but that will bring glory to God. Let's press into these very things and into this fluency for God's glory, for the church's witness, and for our body to function properly. You have grace. You have grace for this. It's given to you. You might actually still be able to taste the grace or to recall the grace that we saw earlier. I don't know what it is for you, but I don't want to rush us out of here. So let's just take some time. Lord Jesus, we, we want to be fluent in the gospel as your people. We want to be unified. We want to see the diversity of the church. And we want to grow up, Lord Jesus. Because we know that we've been called to do this. We want to be like you. Because we know that you form your image in us. We want to sink our roots deeply and know what we can do. We want to play our part, Lord Jesus. Every part. For the proper function and the build up of your body. Lord Jesus, give us a lot of grace in these eight weeks. Please transform our lives. Please unshackle us from all of our distractions and all of these things that are of second importance that keeps us so busy and distracted. Open up our eyes to see your goodness. Give us the courage to act obediently to your word. Your mercy is infinitely more, Father God. And it's everything we need. As we respond now, will you let these words seep into our hearts deeply?